Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all participants of the Micronutrient Forum. I'm Martin Packer, Senior Manager for Advocacy and Brand at the International Rice Research Institute, and I'll be your moderator for this session, entitled Micronutrient Intervention Marketplace, Exploring Complementary Approaches to Nutrition Delivery. Micronutrient deficiency is a serious public health issue in many of the countries that our institute and our colleagues work in. Improving the nutritional con content of a staple food, like rice, can help deliver additional nutrients to those who need it the most. As we broaden our nutrition and food security interventions, we're looking at how to complement tried and tested interventions and fill the nutrition gap in our partner communities. This session is divided into three parts. Um, our first section will focus on a broad range of nutrition interventions, um, followed shortly by country-specific experiences in implementing these activities. Each speaker will have 10 minutes each. We'll then proceed to a moderated discussion. And to close the session, I will do my best to synthesize all, everything and all the interesting input that we've learned into a call to action. Now, our first panelist is Eddie Bernat, who is the co-founder and CEO of Frontier Nutrition, a US-based nutrition company with a mission to end malnutrition in low-income countries around the world. Eddie is going to share with us Frontier's experience in building a market for ultra-affordable fortified packaged foods in Bangladesh. Eddie, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Martin. And uh, thank you to uh, Iri for inviting me to, to be a panelist here and, and um, welcome to all my co-panelists as well. I'm really looking forward to a, to a productive conversation and a lot of learning. Um, so uh, as Martin mentioned, my name is Eddie Bernat. I'm the, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Frontier Nutrition. And um, I'm here today to talk about a consumer-driven intervention, building a market for nutritious snacks in Bangladesh. Uh, which will give a little bit of background about our work um, in Bangladesh uh, uh, developing a brand for fortified ultra-affordable packaged foods. So we'll start with a short video, uh, about 90 seconds, that'll give you some of the background about the work that we do. Um, and from there, I'll, I'll continue on and, and talk about a few of the lessons that we've learned. Hi, I'm Eddie. I came to Bangladesh seven years ago for a job. The beauty of this country and its extraordinary people have kept me here. Bangladesh is one of the fastest growing economies in the world. While parents have more money in their pockets, there are few good options for feeding themselves and their children. As a result, nearly 9 million children still suffer from malnutrition, and 300,000 die every year from a lack of access to nutritious and affordable foods. That's why we developed Hashi Kushi, an innovative, affordable and delicious, ready-to-eat solution proven to treat and prevent malnutrition. Hashi Kushi is the snack every child can enjoy, every parent can trust, and every family can afford. Hashi Kushi fortified lentil butter is made from good stuff, freshly roasted lentils, ground puff rice, oil, and a little sugar, and is fortified with 23 critical vitamins and minerals. Priced at just six cents a serving, it is a delicious, simple, and affordable way to get all the macro and micronutrients a child needs in a convenient little pouch. Over the last two years, we built a state-of-the-art factory, developed three delicious flavors, and started distributing Hashi Kushi in more than 15,000 stores across Bangladesh, where more than 10 million people have access to our products every single day. Our goal is to end malnutrition, and while we have a long way to go, we have nine million of the best reasons to get to work every day. Join us to help bring a healthy smile to every child. Thanks, Ken. So that's a little bit about, uh, about the work that we do. Um, as I mentioned, Bangladesh is one of the largest and fastest growing economies in the world. On the right here, you see uh, global GDP growth in the red line. The blue line is Bangladesh GDP growth. Uh, and then above that, the yellow line is um, uh, snack, the snack market. So uh, incomes are rising and consumers are spending more of that money on snacks uh, and snacks are outpacing uh, uh, GDP growth overall. Next slide, please. Uh, but at the same time, uh, while Bangladesh has made tremendous progress over the last 30 years, over the last 10 years or so, uh, uh, stunting and, and wasting among children as well as 
um, uh, micronutrient micronutri deficiencies among uh, pregnant women and pregnant lactating women uh, have remained stagnant. Um, by some estimates, nearly a half of women and half of children are suffering some, from some sort of, of uh, micronutrient deficiency or other uh, uh, malnutrition. Um, but at the same time, while we're seeing more consumers eat snacks and a greater variety of snacks, very few of those snacks are healthy um, and, and very few of them would be considered appropriate for kids. So this is kind of uh, why we started our company and, and kind of the, the, the different strands that we're trying to pull together in our approach. Next slide, please. Um, so in essence, we wanna create products that are uh, familiar and affordable in the same way uh, as traditional snacks or local snack foods, um, but are much more nutritious. And we do that through micronutrient fortification. Um, and we basically, we wanna be an alternative to very expensive imported products um, where we are as nutritious or more nutritious, but priced uh, at a much lower price point. And on the right, you can see our core product, the, the, our, our major innovation, which is a, a fortified lentil butter. Um, and uh, if you go to the next slide, please, uh, this fortified lentil butter, um, you know, provides, uh, between five and 40% of the RDI across 23 micronutrients. And it's based on a, a, a body of research into lipid based nutritional supplements. Um, and basically we've taken the recipes that were developed in this body of research, um, across Europe, Africa, and Asia and basically uh, made it more affordable, tastier, and built a, a brand around it. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and what we like to highlight about our product, about this core lentil butter, is that on a per calorie basis and on a, a per nutrient basis, it is much more affordable and much more nutritious than other common uh, products. Uh, and so this is something that that we've really focused on as our value proposition to try and um, create options for consumers who are eating more snacks, um, but don't have options that also address their uh, nutrition needs. Um, and if you go to the next slide, please. And one of the um, key lessons that we learned early on is as we developed this lentil butter um, was that um, consumers in Bangladesh like consumers everywhere need choice. And so we created a lentil butter that was introduced and became popular in the market, but it wasn't something that consumers were gonna eat once a day or twice a day. And so we realized that we needed to get closer to where consumers already were in their snacking habits, as opposed to just introducing a new type of product, a lentil butter, we needed to figure out how to include the same level of micronutrient fortification at the same or similar price but in different types of products. So over the last three years, we've developed a range of other products. Now 23 different SKUs from powdered drinks and liquid drinks to cream filled biscuits and chocolate coated biscuits to chocolate bars um, that contain a similar micronutrient profile and a similar price point. But it means that consumers have choice when they go to the store that they can have anything that they want to snack on that day, all of which will provide uh, the basic micro, micronutrients uh, that they that they might be missing from the standard diet. Um, so that's a, a a brief bit about what we've been working on in Bangladesh. I look forward to to answering questions and and connecting with all of you over the rest of this uh, this morning or evening of your time. Wow! Um, thank you, thank you, Eddie, for for giving us a, a taste. Of, uh, what it, of what it takes to, um, to, to succeed in the, in the nutrition. Um, our next speaker is an esteemed professor at Mahidol University of Nutrition in Thailand. Um, sorry, the Mahidol University's Institute for Nutrition in Thailand. Um, Dr. Chavasit's experience in nutrition interventions ranges from um, developing fortified and functional food products to his current work on nutrition education for consumers. Dr. Chavasit, please proceed with your presentation. Thank, thank you, Martin. Um, so um, today, when we talk about the food or nutrition education, in fact, it is um, something that we want, 
people to understand about food and nutrition. And when you look at the food relation to um, agriculture, food, nutrition, and health, it means that from this slide, you can see that when we have food that come from agriculture produce, we want to have impact of food on health, for sure. And look, food and health is something that you can see, we can touch. But in terms of the nutrition, it's kind of abstract. So it's very, 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 very hard to make the people understand nutrition. And then when you eat food with nutrition in mind in your mind, and then you get in it into the in form of health. So in this case, you need very good education, and education have to based on the food culture. And in order to get education become effectively, you have to have the food security. Um, it's not easy to have the uh, food education to be successful because when you talk about successful education, it means that you must change people behavior. That has been a their body, in their culture. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. So when you eat food, right, you need to have basic energy. First, you have to have energy that you need. You spend energy and you need energy to compensate it. But when you talk about nutrition, nutrient is more quality now. It's qualitative now. And in terms of the healthy diet, that means that you have to have something else to make your system work very well, your body system work very well. So this is need a lot of education that to make people understand from what, not just to fulfill their stomach, but they have to be the quality one. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, you can see this one. When you have talk about quality, right? People take a nutrient analysis, or now you have to say not nutrient analysis, you need to know what is in the food, right? And then you get the profile of that food out. Many times the food is not good enough by itself, or people don't eat enough good food, so you have to reformulate it. Fortification is one, one, one of it. Or even bio fortification is one of it. You want to modify the nutrient profile of the original one to be the better one. So you say that it's healthier food. It, in fact, healthier food cannot be healthy. You need diversifying of the healthy of the healthier food. Some food may not may not be healthy enough, but if you mix with other food, you can become a healthy diet. So healthy diet is a keyword that you must have a lot of combination of the food together in order to get it become the diet that become healthy. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. Last slide, talk about combination of diversified food. This is example of some time diversifying diet can get by itself automatically. This is a, this slide show that um, the new theory for the land use in agriculture based on the um, King Rama, the nine, the, our late king, that uh, we call sufficient economy land use. This one, you can see that he suggests the farmers to divide their land into four parts. The first part, this is important to have the water reservoir first. And in the water reservoir, you can do aquaculture, you can feed the fish or any and uh, aqua animals. And also another part, because for land for the orchard, you can grow vegetable, fruit, any kind of fruit that you want to eat, you can grow it. The, 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 another part is the stable food. This is for energy. Rice field. You have to have some part to grow rice for your family only. And then another part is the residential, residential area or the house and garden. With the backyard gardening, you can feed the small uh, animal, for example, chicken or even pigs in there. So in this uh, design or this under this strategy, people can live by their own. May, they, may, they may not be able to own a lot of income, but they have food security. And the most important is they have biodiversity in their land. So they have some resilience to any kind of um, crisis that will occur to them, right? So even the um, climate change or whatever, this one can, have, can be some resilience for the farmers. So this is one way that people can get diversified diet 
automatically automatically buy don't have to have a lot of money so they can sell some surplus uh, agriculture produce from their land but they would not have so much money but they have food security next slide please yeah so this is a example of the people the farmers that do with that theory with, with, with the king rama the night theory uh, next slide please yeah. next slide please this is another way of education you can see that on the on the far left on the top this is the uh, recommendation of FAO the WHO. It's quite complicated. And on the top right, you can see that this is uh, from from the from the recommendation you can make FBDG right. Still complicated. In order to make the complicated issue to be simplified and change to be knowledge, and then that knowledge can affect in terms of the behavior change. You need to understand the culture. So you can see the graphical FBDG in different style up to the country. So that one is a cultural concept come in, right? That one, one way that we try to communicate with the people to educate the, cons the consumer. Another way we, we try to educate them with the traditional um, front of pack, uh, I mean back of pack labeling or traditional nation labeling. That one is a lot of information, but it's so complicated. So we know that it's not understandable. So now it's changed to be front of pack labeling that more simplify and then hit to the point that okay we want to hit ncd we just go for the nutrient that cost ncd even the design here you can see that it's based on the culture some design uh, try to show something that based on the culture and try, try to guide to them to buy that product but in fact in in many culture they prefer to have positive approach that means that if you produce the good, the food that uh, healthier, you can get that symbol. But then some in some culture, this kind of communication can be negative approach. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is negative approach. They they just um, label on the products that they think that, oh, this is not unhealthy, and then they label on it. So this is a way of education also, right? Next slide, please. I give you this example that this is a um, healthy logo we call front of pack labeling in Thailand. Before we get this logo, we try to show the symbol that not guide them to see that this is the healthy one. We just try to make it very neutral that this is something that make you happier, but it's not healthier. I am not not healthy. It, it, it's only healthy, healthier one because it's still not healthy yet because it's only one kind of food, right? And so we have to understand how people think about it when they have this symbol on the on the products. For example, if we have only the symbol, no description under the symbol, people may think that everything in, in this product is very good. But in fact, this product, we only we give this symbol in order to tell them that this product is low in sugar fat and sodium not other not other things so this kind of communication is really important not not make the consumer to be you know misunderstanding or something like that so when, when we when we talk about education it's not easy and even this symbol have been in many countries for a long time the impact that we expect is not the changing behavior or not changing eating behavior. I think the most that we can get is only changing buying behavior only. In order to change the eating behavior or even healthy behavior, you need a lot more effort in many ways to communicate with the consumer. Yeah, I will stop at this point and uh, maybe I can answer it later. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Chavasit, um, for walking us. First of all, for walking us through the agriculture for for nutrition and health continuum, um, and also introducing kind of some of the complementary interventions that help uh, that have helped address Thailand's food security and nutrition goals. Um, this actually dovetails really, really nicely um, with the topic of our next speaker, my colleague, Dr. Russell Reinke, uh, who is our senior scientist for biofortification at Erie. 
and the project leader for the Healthier Rice program. Um, Dr. Ranke will present our work on biofortification and how it can complement existing micronutrient interventions. Russell, take it away. Thank you very much, Martin. So as Martin said, my name's Russell Renke and I'm the lead for the Healthier Rice Project at Erie. And together with our national partners, Phil Rice in the Philippines and the Bangladesh Rice Research Institute in Bangladesh, our work is aimed at improving the nutritional value of rice. And initially we're going to do that through the inclusion of beta carotene, which is in golden rice. And then following that, improving the zinc and iron content of milled rice as well, to, and ultimately to combine those elements together in the one product that will address all three micronutrient deficiencies. Next slide, thanks, Ken. So nutrition is a, a fundamental foundation, of course, for the population to be able to reach their full potential. And clearly external shocks like this current pandemic can really slow um, progress on improving nutrition. And it's, it's ab absolutely amazing to me that even in 2020, there's still 2 billion people who suffer from micronutrient malnutrition and even more, 3 billion who simply cannot afford to have a healthy diet. So the effects of micronutrient malnutrition are manifested individually, of course, in people, but there's an impact nationally and also globally, uh, when people are unable to reach their potential physically and intellectually, of course, this has a, a huge impact. The Global Panel on Agriculture and Food Systems for Nutrition calls for nutrient rich staple crops that are available, accessible, affordable and desirable for all. Next slide. Thanks, Ken. So there are many approaches, of course, to address micronutrient deficiencies, and, and all of these have value. Um, wherever there's been an effective implementation of any or all of these approaches, there's been considerable impact. And most of these are actually long-standing interventions, and, and their promotion and implementation absolutely must continue. Um, I'd suggest that biofortification is perhaps the most recent of the tools that have been added to this uh, suite of interventions, and, and it has the potential to complement the other approaches, providing, uh, I would argue, an affordable and additional way of improving nutrition. Next slide. So what does biofortification mean? Well, very simply, it means that the improved nutrition is actually embedded in the crop. There's a number of ways in which the biofortification can be carried out. We may, in fact, uh, change management of the crop, for example. Uh, and there's some evidence that if you give an additional foliar spray of a specific nutrient, and I'm thinking of zinc here, um, during active grain filling, you may um, be able to influence the, the amount of zinc in the grain. Or alternatively, if there's natural variation for a specific trait like zinc, um, in rice in particular, then we can use conventional plant breeding to accumulate genes for that, for that trait. However, if there's no naturally occurring variation, then we, can, we need to transfer the necessary genes using biotechnology to achieve our goals. Or more recently, we may be able to use gene editing to make very small changes at very precise locations in the genome to give the desired result. Next slide. So for this approach to be successful, there's a, uh, a number of factors that are necessary, and these have been outlined in a recent paper, and I've put that reference uh, on the bottom of the slide. So clearly the traits must be attractive or desirable for both farmers and consumers for the intervention to be a self-sustaining one. And this is actually reasonably challenging for more nutritious crops because there's no immediate value to the farmer unless productivity is improved in some way. And that might include, you know, uh, farmers being able to get an improved price for their product. So clearly the desired changes in the crop have to be sufficient to have an impact on health and not only meet that threshold value, but also be absorbed and active uh, when they're eaten. Finally, the implementation requires the necessary attention to the entire value chain from farmers through to consumers, 
to make sure that all are educated and engaged to make it a sustainable intervention in the long run. Next slide. So a rice-based solution makes sense when rice is a large proportion uh, of the daily diet. Um, for the poor in Bangladesh, a lot of their income is spent on rice and many cannot afford to have a diverse and therefore a balanced and nutritious diet. And similarly in the Philippines, where a significant proportion of the income is also spent on rice, and it's a large part of the daily diet and even more so in the poorest households. So as this slide says, um, rice is obviously very widely grown and eaten, uh, not only in Asia and South Asia, but increasingly in the African continent as well. And because of the quantities uh, commonly consumed and also the frequency of rice consumption in rice-based diets, even a small change in the nutrient content can give significant and ongoing benefits to consumers. So where micronutrient malnutrition exists, it's actually quite rare that it's just one micronutrient at a time that's limiting. More commonly, um, populations and the vulnerable within them suffer from multiple micronutrient deficiencies simultaneously. So as I noted earlier, our aim is to combine um, multiple micronutrients uh, into one variety and deliver them simultaneously. Next slide. So golden rice is the most advanced of our products uh, and it's been engineered to produce beta carotene in the grain which is then converted into vitamin A as needed and it gives the grain the golden colour that you can see in that image. So there were just uh, two genes or genes for two enzymes that were added to make golden rice, a gene for phytoene synthase which came from maize uh, and one uh, phytoene saturase uh, gene from a common soil microorganism. So the thing is that golden rice grows and performs exactly like ordinary rice. Um, and our aim, as noted there, is to provide 30 to 50% of the estimated average requirement for vitamin A. Next slide. So if we return to those key factors that are necessary for successful biofortification, and have a look at, uh, at whether we can meet those with golden rice, then firstly, I think we can provide value to consumers and be an attractive trait if the consumers are appropriately aware of the nutritional benefits that golden rice brings. With respect to farmers, as I mentioned before, our current offering is a little more difficult to sell, but it's in the background of a variety with which they're very familiar and they don't have to change the management of the crop for, uh, for this existing and well-known variety. So in summary for farmers, it's really the status quo, uh, I guess. And in future iterations of healthier rice, we'll transfer the, uh, the, the construct, the genes that are required to put beta carotene into the grain into other um, more advanced lines that contain all of the, the farmer friendly traits. Secondly, um, the levels of beta carotene are such that after accounting for the losses, the inevitable losses that occur during storage, processing and cooking, we can still reach our target of 30 to 50% of the estimated average requirement. And um, when this is added to the vitamin A that exists already in the diet, the aim is that we shift an entire cohort of the population um, out into um, uh, you know, being sufficient for that particular micronutrient for vitamin A. But lastly, to achieve the uptake of the product by both farmers and consumers, we're working to develop deployment plans, beginning in specifically targeted areas in the Philippines and Bangladesh, and just on a pilot scale initially, so that we can engage and inform all the actors in the value chain and they can see the, the, um, the value of the product from their perspective. And the, the aim here is to have a sustainable intervention that continues delivering benefit without the necessity for constant subsidy or any incentive. Next slide, thank you. So as we get closer to achieving regulatory approval and beginning the deployment of golden rice, it's increasingly evident that uh, advocacy and communications are actually of equal importance to the underlying science. Um, it's critical to achieving the, the approval in the first place since regulators and policymakers and government officials not only consider the safety and benefit of the product, but they're very mindful 
and I'd argue sometimes too mindful of the political environment as well. And, um, and further, there's a clear role to play for advocacy and uh, communications to create awareness, but not only that confidence in the product, and that will facilitate principled decision making. Um, advocacy and communication is also critical in the deployment and scaling up phases as well uh, to create and facilitate the necessary partnerships and of course the consumer awareness that leads to a self-sustaining intervention. Next slide. I want to conclude with this quote from Michelle Obama which, um, which really speaks to the fundamental right of not only having enough food for all and especially children but it has to be suitably nutritious food as well. So in its own way, this quote echoes the call from the Global Panel on Agriculture and Food Systems for Nutrition, where they call for the sustainable production of sufficient nutrient-rich staple foods that are available, accessible and affordable and desirable to all. Next slide, thank you. And I finish with this slide in closing. Um, thanks for the opportunity to give this presentation. And I like to always highlight these two happy, healthy children from the Philippines and Bangladesh, because they're a vivid reminder that our final goal is happy, healthy children who have all the nutrition that they need to reach their full potential. Thanks. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Russell, um, and all our panelists. For, um, for sharing the, the advantages and, and the challenges of your, of your respective nutrition interventions. Um, so we're gonna move into the second part of the, um, of the discussion where we're going to be hearing about the experiences of the, of the implementers who actually bring these nutrition services right to the ground, to the communities. Um, so our first, um, our first guest um, is from the Philippines. Ms. Marisa Almario, who is the City Nutrition Action Officer of Pasig City, uh, one of the highly urbanized cities uh, comprising the country's national capital region, um, Metro Manila. Ms. Almario, the floor is yours. A pleasant day to all of you. I will be sharing with you the Micronutrient Supplementation Program of the Philippines, in particular in the city of Pasig, where I live and work. Next slide, please. Next slide. My talk will focus on the priority targets for the program, the funding sources, how we integrate the program with other existing uh, programs and service delivery points, the gaps and challenges in micronutrient supplementation program, the pr practices that matters and what works. Next slide, please. So under this program, high dose vitamin A, iron supplements, micronutrient powder, and fortified food products are provided to high-risk vulnerable groups, which includes the infants and children 0 to 59 months old, the pregnant and lactating women, the female adolescents, and the non-pregnant land lactating women of reproductive age. Next slide, please. The program is funded mainly through the local government unit and logistic support from the Department of Health. Next slide, please. To maximize resources and reach a wider segment of the target population, the program is usually integrated in other programs and service delivery points, such as during the conduct of routine health center activities like immunization, pre- and postnatal checkups, and regular consultations. Next slide, please. Vitamin A supplementation is also conducted during nationwide activities such as the National Immunization Campaigns and the Operation Timbang Plus, which is the massive weighing of all 0 to 59 months old children. Next slide, please. And even during calamities and disasters, under our nutrition response during emergencies, micronutrient supplements, including fortified complementary foods, are provided to infants and young children, pregnant and lactating mothers at the evacuation center. Breastfeeding is also promoted and protected even in times of emergencies. Next slide, please. The program is also incorporated in other nutrition-specific and nutrition-sensitive programs, such as the Home Food Production Program, where in-target beneficiaries undergo training on urban home vegetable garden and were provided with vegetable garden kits for them to establish their own vegetable kitchen garden. 
Next slide, please. Under our National Dietary Supplementation Program, the use of fortified food products such as iodized salt and iron-fortified rice, fruits and veggies are a prerequisite in the conduct of the feeding program. Even in this time of pandemic, family food packs provided to the affected families contains the same food items. Next slide, please. To improve the diet of the families and encourage them to adopt proper eating habits, nutrition education activities are conducted in various settings, whether it be in the community, in the school, in the workplace, through the conduct of food demonstrations, nutrition counseling sessions, distribution of nutrition information materials, and the use of the social media platform, which proves to be very useful and effective in this time of pandemic. Next slide, please. However, despite the many efforts to address the micronutrient problem in the country, there are still a lot of issues and concerns that needs to be addressed. And, what of, and one of these is the low coverage in the supplementation of the micronutrient. Next slide, please. So this can be due to the following issues and concerns. Number one is the funding or, and the logistics. The limited funding resulted in prioritization of targets for supplementation. There is also a delay in the delivery of logistics, which may be to the, due to the tedious procurement procedure of the government. We also have to take a look at the target beneficiaries' acceptance and compliance to the program, their health-seeking behavior, and the utilization of health services by our targets. We have to find out the reasons for their poor health-seeking behavior. Is it because our health facilities are not accessible to our clients? Are there enough supply of medicines? Are health personnel always around at the health facilities? Case detection of micronutrient deficiencies are also not consistently integrated in the health services for mothers and children. Affordability of some laboratory procedures such as hemoglobin testing is also an issue. Some of the health and nutrition workers may not also be aware or updated on the micronutrient supplementation policies and guidelines issued by the Department of Health. With regards to our human resources, there is a scarcity of trained health workers on the micronutrient supplementation work program, especially at the field level. And this situation became worse due to the COVID-19 pandemic, wherein most of the health workers are being utilized for COVID responses. With regards to our micronutrient supplementation information management, the lack of an updated, complete, and reliable data can have an effect on the outcome of the program. Said data is very much needed for action and planning purposes, as well as for evaluating the effectiveness of the program. Client referral, follow-up, and tracking. There is a possibility that not all patients or targets are referred to the health facility or there are no follow-up of cases at the household level. This can be due to the limited health manpower at the field level. Next slide, please. So how do we deal with these issues? What practices matters and what works? A whole of government approach from the national government agencies, the local government units, civil society organizations and other stakeholders, and the community itself is needed to ensure the effective implementation of the program. Integration and collaboration is the key in reaching a wider segment of the target beneficiaries and maximizing our resources. The program must always be integrated in the delivery of various programs, specifically the Safe Motherhood Program and the First 1,000 Days of Life Program. We also need to mobilize the community, organize nutrition and breastfeeding support groups who can deliver the much needed services at the grassroots levels, such as nutrition counseling, client and service delivery tracking, among others. There is also a need to bring the health services as close to where the people live and work. Next slide, please. 
our frontline health and nutrition workers, including program managers, must be provided with continuous trainings. Supportive supervision must be provided, which may be in the form of competency trainings or technical updates. Policies and guidelines on the program must be disseminated at all levels. Incentives may be provided to frontline workers to sustain their motivation to deliver quality services, which may be in the form of allowances or recognitions for a job well done. Nutrition promotion activities in various settings must be provided for behavior change, for social mobilization, and for advocacy activities. Next slide, please. A tool for forecasting, procurement, storage, distribution, and delivery of supplies must be developed to ensure the timely delivery of logistics. Likewise, an effective recording and monitoring system at the field level must be in place so that we can effectively and accurately evaluate the program. Electronic generated and real-time data must always be ready and available. Last slide, please. Lastly, the successful implementation of the Micronutrient Supplementation Program can lead to the achievement of our Millennium Development Goal of reducing under five and maternal deaths and address the micronutrient needs of other population groups. Let us all work together to achieve this goal for a better future for the next generation. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. That ends my lecture. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Amario. Um, to share the Bangladesh experience now, we have uh, Dr. SM Mustavidur Rahman, who is the line director of the National Nutrition Services at the Institute of Public Health. Dr. Rahman, over to you. Okay. Distinguished uh, participant in this uh, Macquinton Forum related recording. I am Dr. S. Mustafa Rahman, who is the line director of the National Nutrition Services in the Institute of Public Health Nutrition. Next slide, please. In this slide, you can see the nutrition status of Bangladesh over the year. This is year 2007. It's called Bangladesh Demographic Health Survey. If you see the starting over the year, it is from 2007 up to 2017, 18. It is 43 to 20. 31 in case of underweight, that is also 41 to 22, and that is uh, for wasting, this is from 17 to 8. So it is improving. I don't know what will happen after the consequence of the corona, but it is so far. Next slide, please. These are the priority activities. As this is the Macronutrient Forum, I will I'll mainly focus on the Macronutrient related things. I will just uh, let you know that uh, from 4th October up to the 17th October, we had completed, just completed the national vitamin A plus campaign. And this time we have done it in a different modality. It, uh, it, it actually, this, that was the one day event for the last couple of decades. But this time we have done it with the 12 working days so that the gathering will not be there and 12 percent yeah, targeted children will, uh, would be covered every day so that was our plan and it worked very fantastically so vitamin a coverage as well as the we have common problem about the anemia about the iron deficiency anemia and other macronutrient related deficiencies for example zinc vitamin a calcium and we are yeah, yeah, promoting uh, IOIC especially, and we are also trying to uh, trying to solve the problem through the be behavioral sense communication because food preparation and other issues are not that much healthy in Bangladesh, and we have problems there which are related with the uh, 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 warm or the health means so. We are trying to get rid of all these things through dietary diversification, supplementation, as well as uh, changes of the behavior about all these things. So even fortification is helping us a lot. Next slide, please. 
So this year, not this year, the last year we have introduced one new program at Lawson Nutrition in the school, but uh, it, that, that one is not working at this moment due to the COVID because of most of the school, at basically not most, all the schools and the education institutes are, we are, we are closed at this moment. We are, uh, we are, but this is a good weekly IFA, week, weekly IFA, we are working with the uh, integrated management and child nutrition yeah, center we are using all the we are using all the available center or delivery program under ministry of the health and other even under ministry of the local government nutrition related things we are, we are just doing the growth monitoring and promotion at the grassroots level which we usually call community clinic and this year we have we have appointed uh, multi-purpose volunteer and uh, those are for one multi-purpose volunteer for 250 household in the rural bangladesh and that is uh, basically one fifth of the country next slide please you can skip this one because all yeah, community clinic to yes yeah, sub district all level hospitals are there next slide please next slide please Okay, so adolescent for me, yeah, no, 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 yeah, go to the back, go to the back, okay. You can see the effective, what we are doing, we are doing, yeah, yeah, we are doing antenatal care, antenatal checkup, and uh, we are using SBCC, and we know about the 100,000, yeah, well, yeah, thousand days, so through that we are providing all the mothers uh, with, with, with monitoring, with counseling, we are providing. 30 to 90 tablet iron folic acid tablet uh, to every, every pregnant woman and uh, requesting them to come after three months and we are using the nutrition um, nutrition information system through the uh, district health uh, systems and we have completed just completed uh, in the august all best spinning week during COVID in a special uh, modality as well as the, I have just mentioned, we have completed the National Vitamin A Plus campaign just uh, last week. Completed. Next slide, please. Okay, challenges we have. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, for every country we have a lot of at this moment challenges. The COVID nineteen, but we are very smooth in implement of the nutrition program in the rural area but in urban area there are a lot of slum there are a lot of floating people there are a lot of people in the multi-state building in some cases even we can't provide su uh, support or service in the multi-state building because they usually don't like the government uh, tablet and other they think they have a law they have enough to eat but they don't know what is nutrition Human skill, skill, human disease is always a challenge, and we are trying to we are trying to make a very good coordination among the stakeholders. That is the government, NGO, the public-private partnership, and interministerial by interministerial interagency coordination. And next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, I want to finish it in that way. The Bangladesh is suffering with a triple burden of the malnutrition. Our burden is over nutrition is a new one, but under nutrition it was always after um, related deficiency it, it was always. But day to day we are improving and we are trying to improve more because the, we need to achieve all the given target of the SDG World Health Assembly and we have vision 2021 we have vision 41 events so that in one day this through this micronutrient uh, intervention through this other intervention we will achieve our goal and finally we, we, we will able to keep the keep the situation of Bangladesh in a state so that our next generation will be healthy, nutritionally sound, and a productive people. Thank you. Bye. Over. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Aman. Thank you, Ms. Almario. Um, so having learned about um, micronutrient interventions from, from the perspective of, of the developers, 
policymakers, implementers, private sector. Um, I'd like to open up the discussion now. Um, sure. and, and I think it would be, uh, it would be useful to, to hear everybody's thoughts on, on food choices and nutrition, particularly as it pertains um, kind of to the current uh, elephant in the room, the, the pandemic. Um, and, and, and how, so, so, and how these really impact kind of uh, nutrition, food choices and, and food systems. So uh, let me begin first with a, with a common question for everyone, uh, which I'm going to put up on screen right now. So um, the nutrition and uh, development sectors, um, could we put the, the question up on screen? The nutrition and development sectors concur that access to nutritious food must be ensured post pandemic. So how effective um, are food-based interventions and, and what steps need to be taken to ensure access? Um, I'd like to start with um, Dr. Chavasit, please. Thank you, Martin. Um, in fact, when we want to talk about the access to the food, to choice, right? In, in my opinion, the one who affect is the people who live in the um, urban area rather than people in the rural area. Because um, if you live in the rural area, you still can do agriculture and you can have more food choice in there. But if you live in the urban area, you have to depend on the um, food system that rely on the commercial one. That one is, is, is very, it's not easy to have a food choice because you don't have enough income already. So in order to have the food, better food choice, Maybe you sub sub supposed to have, for example, like a, you know, um, the system of the government to support you with some kind of support in terms of the, um, like a, you know, food, um, like a system that you can provide the food to the people for free or for, uh, you know, in the low cost. That one is the people who live in the urban area. But if you live in the rural area, hopefully they have the land to do the agriculture and by the na by the nature of the people in the rural area you can you know exchange the food also but this is one thing another thing is uh, the the area in the rural area you can have more food choice from the nature so this is a point so in thailand right now if you are the people who immigrate or migrate to the to the city and you don't have the job now they try to encourage you to go back to the rural area and then try to have the you know the 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 new theory of agriculture that i mentioned to you before that to make sure that you have enough food security with income is the second priority not the first priority now but you have something to eat first so this is the why the, the one that uh, i think i feel that people in the urban area that need more help than the people in the rural area thank you Thank you very much, Dr. Chavasit. Um, I would like to invite um, Eddie and uh, Russell to um, also provide their, their thoughts and input on the question. Eddie, you might uh, like to go first. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Um, so, Access was one of the motivating factors, or lack of access was one of the motivating factors behind why we started Frontier Nutrition and um, what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, you know, there's a, a major role to play for the government and for um, nonprofits and the humanitarian sector in providing um, nutritious access to nutritious food to uh, the, the folks who, and families who need it the most. Um, but our approach has been that um, if you look globally at products like Coca-Cola or you look at um, Unilever products, um, folks who, who, who don't have access to, to anything else will have access to these types of, of fast moving consumer goods. And so um, even if you don't have access to a government program or you don't have access to, to, to philanthropic support, um, you will have access to commercial products. And so um, 
the, the key for us is trying to, to use those types of strategies in terms of marketing and distribution and product development to also deliver, um, in our case, the, the micronutrient fortification that a lot of these uh, families need. Um, so, so we think that um, it's obviously a collaboration between the private sector and the public sector, but that the private sector has a, has a key role to play in providing affordable and accessible products um, to everybody. And the way to do that is to provide, um, uh, basically to provide profit margins for uh, distributors and retailers to earn an income uh, and to provide incentives so that they're going to make their products available uh, uh, to consumers um, because that's how they earn their livelihood. So for us, that's been, that's been kind of where we're trying to add value in the ecosystem. <clears throat> Thanks, Eddie. Um, Russell? Yeah, um, so I probably come at this from a very different angle because my, my experience has been much more within agriculture and, uh, and much less so within nutrition. So you have to keep that in the, the back of your mind. But I was really struck by the complexity of some of the interventions. You know, some, when we talk about some of the, the, the people working in this field, you know, the, the, the physical logistics of, um, of getting something like, for example, the vitamin A capsules. And I, I know for this question, we're talking about food-based ones, but I'm thinking of the contrast to the, to the other sort of interventions there and how challenging it is. And I know that Bangladesh has been doing this over the past few days or week. Um, and it's been amazing to look at the dashboard where they're, follow, they're tracking the progress of the distribution uh, across the country. And I'm just, amazed at how uh, complex a logistical issue it is, but deeply impressed at the same time. So I think we've got an advantage when, when we actually use a food-based intervention because we have a ready vehicle that carries the improvement with it. Um, and uh, I guess I'm influenced by the fact that I've thought a lot about rice because rice is is uh, certainly in Bangladesh anyway, but also in many Asian countries, it's a, it's a very significant part of the daily diet. And we don't have to make much change to it to actually have a huge impact because of the sheer frequency with which people eat it and the quantities in which they eat. So I think rice is, is a good vehicle for, um, you know, for, for such an intervention. And I think that, that food-based interventions carry that innate advantage with them. I was really impressed, Eddie, to see that you started with um, a couple of products but rapidly realised that you needed to also include diversity within your range so that you actually get the, uh, the frequency of, of, uh, of consumption, right, increasing, which then increases the, the effectiveness of your product. Um, so I think it's interesting the way that diversity theme also ties in with um you know with actually having a healthy diet as well because you know dietary diversity is a is a significant significantly correlated with um with micronutrient malnutrition as well so the lower the diversity the more likely you are to to have that um uh, micronutrient malnutrition. So those are my thoughts about uh, about food-based interventions. I'm not sure if they're helpful or not, but the uh, the overwhelming complexity of the non-food-based ones is, is quite a contrast in my mind. Well, I'd just like to to add an additional level of complexity, Russell, um, mm -hmm. to comment on on um, specifically around the operational difficulty when you are using a market-based intervention. Mm -hmm. um, one of the products that we launched actually was a, a, a fortified rice. Now it wasn't a, a biofortified rice. We were using mm. um, uh, kind of the, the post blended rice. And yeah. uh, you know, one of our solutions was instead of requiring um, families to buy, you know, a full one kg or five kg of blended rice, we were providing just a, a 10 gram sachet of fortified rice that could then be mixed in prior yeah. to cooking. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were really excited about it for all the reasons um, that you've mentioned around it being a, st a staple um, for consumers. Um, and one of the benefits to the product is that it doesn't change the taste. 
Um, it doesn't change the cooking time. Um, but what we found when we were asking consumers to purchase is that um, uh, fortification doesn't work like pharmaceuticals. You don't take a five day course and see outcomes. It's something that requires um, daily vigilance and, and is part of habit building and takes years. Mm -hmm. um, and so when consumers didn't see, you know, weren't being, first of all, uh, they're being asked to pay more for uh, essentially the same product, but at the same time, they're not seeing an effect and a change. Now mm -hmm. in the, 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 the research that I've seen, when you do in fact change the way the product looks or tastes, that also doesn't necessarily incentivize um, uh, uptake. And yeah. so we actually ended up after, after six months of trying to sell a fortified rice product through our channel, um, we ended up kind of putting it off and, and maybe trying to pick it up at a later date uh, because the, the value proposition of a snack, of something that's you know, sweet and tasty um, and you know, fits into the snacking habit, um, <laughs> Uh, made uh, more sense to consumers who were going out and purchasing things every day um, as part of their habit. So uh, I think that that there's definitely a place for for staple fortification, and we see globally things like you know iron or excuse me uh, ionization mm -hmm. of salts and the supplementation of, of vitamin A and vitamin D and milk and oil um, mm -hmm. that takes place at a policy level. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of a, a asking consumers to make choices in the short term, uh, it's something that we're still struggling with uh, mm -hmm. when we're talking about staples like rice. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Eddie and, and, and Russell. Um, I'd like to also get, um, allow Dr. Rahman and uh, Ms. Almario to um, present their thoughts on this question. Uh, Dr. Rahman? Please. Basically, nutrition and development sector is now in a threatened condition because Bangladesh has suffered for suffered by two types of the pandemic. One is global pandemic that the COVID which reduces the employment and uh, we have also suffered by flood for four times within the last four months. So in that case so food based approach what we do basically we are also for the uh, vgd or different types of the safety net program we are trying to provide them uh, with fortified rice and fortified wheat and others as well as the we are promoting the diversification of the food but you know the diversification is now a question because 16% people uh, lost their job and due to the flood, repeated flood, okay, it, it was almost three-fourths of the country. The cultivation was suffered and fish was flooded away. So in some cases, this is a new challenge. We are doing good. If you see the data, what I have presented and what uh, we have seen in the first presentation by Russell, so we have seen all these things. We are uh, doing very good, but due to this year, uh, this uh, man-made disaster, not man-made disaster, as well as the uh, climate change-related issue, we are suffering. But food-based approach is the best approach. I always think if we can diversify the food, uh, and we can, uh, if we can do some fortification, what is already in our country, and if we, edible oil is uh, uh, fortified with the with the yeah, vitamin A, we have yeah, fortified rice, we have fortified wheat, and some other things when we are using monimix, multimix, many things. So this is a challenge and we we are confident enough, we will able to overcome this yeah, pandemic related yeah, undernutrition or micronutrient deficiency, what is going to increase yeah, for the couple of months. And I don't know when this pandemic will be over, when people will get their job back and when their affordability will be as before as the yeah, early part of the yeah, yeah, year in February we are okay even in March we are okay but after that from March up to the up, as of today we are suffering a little bit but we are confident we will overcome all this barrier and we will able to yeah, yeah, continue our development and we are able to increase our nutrition status in 
both way, mm -hmm. macrointerrelated deficiency, we are fighting and we, will, uh, we, are, inter uh, we are confident enough to overcome and of diversification of the food because fortunately our land is very fertile but we have other problem for example in a small country where we have 170 plus million year population so in that case this is a problem otherwise we are confident and we are hopeful to overcome the situation over thank you thank you dr Rahman. um miss Mario, your thoughts okay. Uh, I think food-based interventions such as the provision of food packs or food, cu food coupons are stopgap measures which will address the immediate needs of the families. However, they are unsustainable in the long term. There is a need to look deeper into the socioeconomic status of the family. Do they have the means to buy these foods? Do they have a means uh, of livelihood? Can they have... They can, can they avail of health services at a minimum cost or no cost at all? These are non-food-based interventions that needs to be provided in combination with the provision of food-based interventions to have a long-term effect on the family. So, uh, with regards to the steps needed to be taken to ensure access, I think there is a need uh, to have a targeted approach in the distribution of supplies, medicines, and food items. We have to identify the individual needs of the families as basis for the provision of assistance. And then we, have, we also have to identify who who and where the families are that we are going to uh, provide assistance for both the food-based and non-food-based interventions thank you very much thank you um thank you all our esteemed panelists um for your your thoughts on that um i would like to um i would like to now call on you two two by two um so the, the next set of questions will be addressed to, to specific speakers. Um, I'm going to call Ms. Mario and Dr. Rahman first. Um, what do you think is the role of, of food in improving the health of families and communities that you're serving? Okay, me first. Yeah, okay. So uh, as we define it, food is something that provides nutrients and nutrients are substances that provides energy for activity, proper growth and development, and all other functions of the body, and for keeping our immune system healthy. So for as long as we eat the right kind and the right amount of food, it will keep us healthy, live longer, healthier, and productive life. As the saying goes, a healthy community leads to a healthy and productive nation. Dr. Rahman? Yeah, I do agree with her, and I do agree with her because food is very important. If you have the yeah, balanced diet, you will get all your energy, what you need from the food, and in that case, your immunity will be boosted up, and in that case, your infection rate will be reduced, and your people will be healthy, and they will be productive, and in that case, we need to ensure we need to ensure one thing okay the, all the people of the bangladesh especially the vulnerable groups should get their their desirable nutrition in amount and uh, with quality and this is now challenging but uh, this is now challenging because we don't know how many people are going to get their, their job back and we have already uh, already suffered due to the uh, flood and harvesting was disturbed a little bit. Anyway, it will be overcome. The harvesting will be overcome by a couple of months. And other challenges, other challenges are not that much important because other challenges are not that not that much important because Bangladesh has taken all uh, all out approaches fortification money mix data diversification water and sanitation related uh, issues so many we are uh, 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 working with the families we are working with the communities we are working with the okay clinic or facilities and we are working with the ppp model we are working with the geo ngo model and we are uh, uh, yeah yeah awareness creation program is going on, production process is going on, and other issues are going on. So we are hopeful that with the 
with the yeah, food because food is essential without food only okay yeah, awareness creation will not work so food is primary okay supplementary is secondary and healthy lifestyle is equally important they should take the exercise uh, exercise every day at least 30 minutes to uh, 30 minutes to one hour and with this one we will overcome the present situation and uh, i think we are in the right track we are suffering a little bit at this moment and we will overcome inshallah over Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Rahman. Thank you, Ms. Almario. Those are, those are some very key and very important insights. Um, my next question is for Eddie. Eddie, um, do, you, do you think that, that kind of the currently available food-based nutrition interventions, um, including but not limited to the ones that we've, that we've described today, um, do you think they're reaching the right communities? Um, you know, what, what, what else do you think could be done to kind of sustain and, and scale adoption of, of more nutritious foods it's the these are great questions uh martin and i and i wish that i had the answers um you know from from my perspective and 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 the work that we're doing um certainly nutrition interventions are reading are reaching some of the right people um whether that's through social safety nets uh whether that's through uh, uh campaigns like like the vitamin a supplementation um program, um, you know, I certainly think that there's a role in, in Bangladesh and other countries like it for um, a continued adoption and enforcement of uh, staple fortification um, that is kind of critical when those nutrients are provided in milk and in oil and in salt and in rice. Uh, I think that you can address a lot of the, a lot of the issues. Um, the gap that we identified uh, were all of the folks who don't have access to um, uh, specific nutritional programming, um, just because it's really challenging to, to reach everybody, especially in a country like Bangladesh, even though it's densely populated. Um, as Dr. Rahman points out, it's, a, it's you know, more than 170 million people, um, most of whom don't have access on a daily basis to uh, government programs or um, uh, government programs or, or you know, a nonprofit or, or, or philanthropic aid. And so um, what people do have access to are the things that they buy from the grocery store every day, uh, whether that's uh, staples or whether that's snack foods like biscuits or uh, chips or chocolate or drinks. Um, and especially when it comes to those types of foods, um, consumers who might not have a, a, an understanding of the importance of micronutrients um, are going to choose to consume those things because they like the way they taste and they like uh, what the brands that they buy say about them as people. Um, and so that's why we've chosen that as, a, as an area that we believe is under addressed and, and it's a, a real opportunity to um, get to, to consumers or customers for us uh, where they are already um, and almost use it like a Trojan horse to deliver the micronutrients that they might not be getting otherwise. Fantastic, Eddie. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, my, 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 my final kind of joint question is for uh, Dr. Chavasit and, and, and uh, Dr. Renke. Um, what kind of information do you think consumers, um, consumers need to know in order to make healthier food choices? I know Dr. Chavasit, um, you presented some of the uh, kind, of, kind of the food labeling. Um, you know, Russell, you, you spoke about kind of working with, with farmers and farmer education. What other things do you think um, consumers is important for consumers to know so that they can make healthier food choices. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, in fact, when you talk about information, I think we got a lot, a lot of information right now from internet, and many of them the fake information. We have to um, we have to gather it and crystallize that what is the fact, and when you get the fact, it can become knowledge, and you need to pass the knowledge to be practical and um, you know, understandable to the consumer, I don't think it's easy. So it's a it's challenge for <clears throat> academician or even the government. So I think it, at this part, we need private sector to help. They have kind, kind of a good marketing per people. They have a, if we can turn that marketing technique to be social marketing, so they can you know, teach the people or educate the people to 
at least have better behavior in the country like a you know developing country industrialized products is not the main carry or main uh, main um, nutrient for the people but the main nutrient for the people come from home cooking from street food from restaurant so how can they make a how can people make a choice because if they understand it okay for home cooking is fine but you have if, if they have to rely on street food or restaurant i don't think they can manipulate the quality of the food to be more nutritious yeah mm -hmm. I, we have the um local front of pack labeling we have a kind of like a you know traditional uh nutrient labeling that not understand it <laughs> i mean we, we wait for 20 or 30 years already but i mean the whole world agree that it's not understandable so we go for front of pack labeling front of pack labeling go for industrial food products mainly but in order to inform the people to understand you i think you need to have a kind of social marketing technique that i mean very good i don't know how to do it right now but in in, in case that we have it even very simple labeling for front of labeling they i mean government asks us when you implement this one can people change their eating habit i think i said no at least they change their buying habit only and hopefully if we have this kind of a healthier um, ingredient, not for products, and they can use that healthier ingredient to cook their food, we can reduce sodium, we can reduce some sugar. From our um, study, if you use this kind of ingredient to cook their food, they can reduce sodium by 30%. That, that indication, they don't change their eating habit. They just change their buying habit. You know, because eating habit, they have to reduce their salt intake. But this one, we use a salt repressor with potassium chloride, and they did still eat the same saltiness. So I have no answer right now. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's all right. We're, we're not we're not we're not expected to come with a magic bullet, but at least you know that we have the conversation started. Um, Russell, um, do you have some thoughts? Yes, I have some thoughts. I don't know whether they'll be helpful or not. But I really liked um, when Dr. Chavasit was talking about, uh, you know, some of the labeling issues. And I liked the idea of keeping it as simple as possible. So I think often when we approach these issues from the point of view of a scientist, what we want to do is delve into the details and we want to provide all of the possible combinations and the information about everything that's in your food and it rapidly gets way too complex for consumers. And so I think, I think it's really important that consumers are guided by some sort of essential principles that will allow them to make healthier food choices. And I think the principle is really embedded in the word diversity. All right. Um, and I think if they, if, if consumers can work from that very simple principle, and think about um, you know, having a diverse diet, as diverse as their income can support, um, then that's naturally, I think, going to take them towards a healthier diet. I would really like to live in a world where everyone had the income that they need to have a diverse and balanced diet. That would be the ideal, of course. Um, and then we wouldn't need to be doing all of this work on putting additional nutrients into staple foods. But we know that we don't live in an ideal world. And as soon as incomes fall, and particularly when it comes to, you know, external shocks like the pandemic that we're currently experiencing, people, when their income falls, they have to go back to the basics and they have to get energy mm -hmm. enough for them and they will naturally tend to lack probably the the diets will decrease in diversity which is a sad fact but it's a reality mm -hmm. um, for that reason i think um, our work in trying to improve the nutritional value of rice is useful in that situation but i hope that we actually move to ultimately to a world in which people have the requisite income to choose a diverse diet 
And if they're guided by that principle, I think they will have innately a healthier diet as a result. Um, may I add something, Martin? Yes, absolutely. Um, Marcel, I think um, this concept about the income, right? We, mm -hmm. we discussed sometime in Thailand that do you need to have more money in order to get better food, right? And mm -hmm. as you are agriculturist, I, and I have um, mentioned about the new agriculture theory that I think ha have been proven for a um, certain extent that you don't have, you need to have, you need not to have so much money in order to get diversified food, but you mm -hmm. have to know how to agriculture. You have to know multiple cropping. You have to know how to, you know, balance uh, in terms of environment in your area. And then you're going to be more resilient to the climate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's absolutely a good point. Um, I was thinking also that it's not perhaps not only driven by income, as you suggest, but it's also driven by access as well. And uh, and and very often, uh, you know, people in these in particularly in some areas just don't have access to the diversity that they need. Therefore, you know, having a diverse land use system and diversifying that is going to be a good thing as well. And I think there's been, I think there's been efforts uh, by nutritionists um, the world over to try and do that in, in many of these places. And I think it's had some impact, but we're still today faced with this problem, the ongoing burden of micronutrient malnutrition. If I can, if I can add something here. Um, oh, absolutely. Uh, uh both what what Russell and and Dr. Chavasita yeah. have mentioned here is this idea of diversity and you know we're sitting we're sitting here at a, a panel um, uh, convened by experts with lots of other experts who know much more than I do about the the, the technical aspects of micronutrient nutrition um, but our, our experience working with consumers is um, that talking about the specific details of specific mic micronutrients or, or exact amounts of different types of foods that you should be eating is very quickly lost and it's hard to communicate. Mm -hmm. But if you do focus on a larger concept of diversity, mm -hmm. that eating more varieties of foods is better. Mm -hmm. Or for example, um, you know, we've, we've realized that there's some resonance when we talk about immunity or we talk about energy. Um, or we talk mm -hmm. about concepts that are particularly for lower income consumers, much more resonant in their daily life. And in terms of the value um, of being able to provide those things to their family, that you can start to influence uh, a behavior more or, or um, connect the concept to the action. Uh, mm -hmm. And so diversity might be one, immunity is another, um, being able to to provide a, a happy and, and healthy life to your family and those that you care about. Um, so when we think about communicating what we've learned here, um, maybe to think about ways that uh, these ideas are are universally understandable and relatable. Mm. And relatively simple concepts at that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That si simple concepts and, and, and kind of, you know, very re relevant to the day to day life of the most vulnerable communities who very often <laughs> do live, you know, hand hand to mouth. Um, you know, I think I think what, what I what I really enjoyed about about this conversation and, and, and these presentations that we're really kind of seeing different perspectives um, and and it, and this this is really going to provide our viewers with a more kind of nuanced picture of the of, of the various interventions um, to improve nutrition and, and what needs to be done to kind of reach that goal. Um, I do have one one final question for I think it it's it's for everyone. Um, not everybody has to answer, um, but I think what, one of the things that that came clear out of out of this is that there's no there's no one size fits all solution for um, <clears throat> for addressing micronutrient deficiencies, and there is, you know, different dif different situations, different um, scenarios required a, a mix of kind of these different interventions. Whether it's um, diversif crop diversification, whether it's um, supplementation, whether it's behavior change communication, whether it's biofortification, um, 
and 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 I think you know it's 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 always a bit of finding that right balance in the different scenarios that's really going to have the highest impact. So I'd like to just open open the floor and, and see if every and, and and invite people to comment. Um, so if you look at, for example, biofortification, which is kind of the the new kid on the block here. Um, it, it, it definitely is a, a complementary intervention to, to existing programs. But what data or factors should, should policymakers, um, but also marketers and consumers, be looking at in order to kind of consider adding biofortification kind of as a, as a, as, as a part of the nutrition toolbox, so to speak? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Hello, who'd yes. like to go? Who would like, who would like to go first? Okay, just one thing I want to just let you know. We, we have discussed about the diversification, supplementation, and we have uh, yeah, talked about the social marketing and affordability and the homemade food and others. Biofortification is one of the important approach one of the important approaches we should go for that also so that will help us to handle the total macronutrient related malnutrition this will add one more positive things that is from my side thank you mm -hmm. thank you dr Rahman. would anyone else like to write yeah. thoughts yeah this it yeah i think um all kind of uh, when, when when you do when you implement something in the country, you have to look at the culture, right? So if your bio 45 products can go along with the culture that have been um, continuous going like that, it's going to be smooth. But if you something that you don't go along with the culture, it's not easy to make people change their habits. So mm -hmm. it can go smoothly with the culture that have been going on already. I think it's going to be very really efficient. So how can you do it like that? Sometimes you have mandatory, for example, if you have fortification and you mandate, for example, salt, iodization, you mandate. That's not easy. But then when you have something different and people can observe it, how can you make them believe that this is better? Even you have the same price. Yeah, this is my opinion. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chavaset. Any other thoughts? Yes, I'd like to just say yes. something, if I might, Martin. Um, I, I, I remember early in, in my talk, I spoke about, like, the exciting thing that I find about biofortification is that if, if this can actually come off as an intervention and if it can be, um, if it can, if this improved nutrition can travel through the, using rice as a vehicle um, to get to the consumers, <clears throat> it adds to the, to the, the micronutrients that are already in the diet and it shifts the entire population towards sufficiency. Um, that's the hope at the moment because we are still in the early stages really of, of, of you know, getting biofortified crops out. It would be really nice if in 20 years time, all right, biofortified crops are actually part of the furniture, they're part of the background and all crops, uh, but particularly rice, has a number of, of um, you know, micronutrients that have been improved either through conventional breeding or through gene editing or whatever techniques are available. It would be really good if that just then flows into the background and, and moves the entire population towards sufficiency. And then I think um, hopefully it will give the other interventions then, the interesting, the more flamboyant ones that Eddie um, has been talking about, you know, the colourful snacks, the um, uh, all of the other complex, more complex interventions, it gives them an added chance of being successful and giving that final amount that's needed to, um, you know, to bring the population to sufficiency. So I'm hoping that that we will kind of move into the background ultimately and that and the, there'll be a constant flow of improved nutrition through biofortification. That would be the ideal, I think, for me. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Um, do we have any, any other thoughts or comments? Um, 
Otherwise, we were we are um, we are running very around getting very close to um, closing time, and um, so I would I would perhaps just ask everybody um, to conclude this panel discussion. Um, I'd like to just maybe go around the table and could you leave us with a with a with a short maximum fifteen word tweetable sound bite that that summarizes your nutrition advocacy, and I'd like to start with. Um, Ms. Almario. Okay, so I think the successful implementation of the micronutrient uh, supplementation program involves the collaboration and the coordination with all sectors of the society from the national government agencies, the local government units, and the community itself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Dr. Roman? We should use all the channels, whether it is the printed channel or in the digital channel, and we should use all the stakeholders to get the right message to everybody so that we can overcome. Thank you. Over. Thank you. Um, Eddie? So I think um, it's really important to meet consumers where they are and uh, to connect with their uh, consumption habits, um, as well as their um, kind of cultural uh, proclivities um, in order to create interventions that are relevant and can be successful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Chavasit? I think different, different country, different community have different contexts. So before you implement anything, you have to understand the context first and then try to do everything that you know as most as to be the best close as the the context that they have yeah so this is going to be the one that we should recognize when we do this kind of program thank you thank you um and last but not least um russell so <clears throat> the theme that has really emerged for me from our discussion this evening is diversity and it's, it's diversity on many levels. There's the diversity of products that Eddie was talking about with his snack foods. There's the diversity of land use that Dr. Chavasit was talking about, which leads then to a diversity of, uh, you know, in the diet, which is critical to getting a balanced and healthy diet. And then I think there's a diversity in all of the interventions as well that are available, of which biofortification uh, is just one, which I hope will be of increasing importance. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, everybody. Um, so I'm going to try to summarize these, these very rich um, um, discussions. And, and I think one of, one of the key things that, that I'm seeing coming out of this is that, that consumer choice is very important. Um, it does require a lot of study. Um, there's a lot of factors to consider, um, you know, not in the least income, external factors, um, you know, what people eat, and of the end, but, but really looking at kind of the entire track from farm to fork and what interventions can be developed, created, and, and implemented and brought to scale in that entire kind of value chain. Um, another point that, that I see was made is that there is most certainly a space for, um, for, for providing, for, for making staples more nutritious. Um, through fortification, uh, diversification um, in environments such as Bangladesh and the Philippines, um, that it's very important to use um, relevant and, and relatable messaging um, when speaking with, with our consumers, so connecting nutrition to uh, immunity, energy, education, health, that really resonates with, with the consumers. Um, and, and last but not least, um, that, that meeting kind of the global nutrition goals really by, by 2025 really requires the input and cooperation of, of multiple stakeholders, um, not in the least of those that are, that are sitting here around the table, with, whether it's research, whether it's um, extension workers, whether it's the private sector. And, and I'm, I'm very pleased um, to, have, to have had such an esteemed panel of, of speakers uh, joining us today. So, so thank you again for, for your participation, um, your time and your patience. Um, so once again, um, I'd like to thank you, um, panelists, uh, but also the, um, our participants and viewers for joining this session. Um, if you do have any questions, our colleagues will be manning the video chat. 
um, which goes live on November 9th and 13th at 3 p.m. Bangkok time. Um, Erie will also have a virtual exhibit booth on the Micronutrient Forum uh, connected platform uh, where you can learn more about the Institute's nutrition and food security initiatives. Um, please join me in wishing our panelists and, and all the viewers uh, a very good evening, a very good day, very good afternoon, wherever in the world you are. Stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you very much.